Well, James Colbert had put Ken Buesler, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, up on his site today. Big story. Ryan Dawson, at the end of his video, his sample video, up on his site, he had personally put in a notation that e and &E News is not a new site, and they certainly are a new site. They link out to all the professors, all the universities, all the institutions, all the both sides of the story, all the mainstream media, anybody that talks about any nuclear issues, not just Fukushima. And so it's a totally credible site. It's not like they're writing the stories, they're just linking you over to the original story. And when you put them together in context, uh, in the single spot, it's a great site. And so for Ryan to do that, you know, you got to realize Ryan is not a news site, okay? James Colbert is not a news site compared to e, e News. They aggregate absolutely everything, both sides of the story, and they don't miss nothing. Um, there's exporting their trash to the radioactive or contaminated soil and trash to other prefectures where it's cut with regular trash and then they burn it just to get around the small regulations they do have that say, well, you, you can't burn this stuff. But if you mix it with normal trash and spread it around enough, then you can burn it. Exactly right, which gets back to the point of what, what are the different vectors by which this radiation can and is entering the ecosystem. And, of course, one of them is through the incineration of waste products around the country here. Um, but of course so E and E News I already beat you, Ryan, many times. Three workers suffered cardiac arrest at Japanese incineration plant associated with cesium-137 exposure. You know why you never heard of that? Because you don't use E and E News. They aggregate it all there. This is a Harvard study made 2007, time at the height, the injection height of the biomass burning emissions in the boreal forest regions. They go on in the study to say that three to five kilometers up is not unusual. This stuff came across the Pacific Ocean to America. This is a June of 2004 ozone production in the Trans-Pacific Asian Pollution Plume. And they're talking about how pollution goes up to five to eight kilometers in the year. Uh, this was from a Harvard study in 2004. And I think it shows that there are there are many uh, sources of radiation and radioactive um, uh, 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 disasters waiting to happen, really, that are local to, to North America that can be now conveniently covered over because people will only be looking at Fukushima as the only possible source of radioactivity, which is a pretty good cover, I think, for the, the nuclear industry in North America to basically cover over all their sins and to, and to say, oh, look, it's all coming from the other side of the Pacific Ocean. The NRC has held more than 150 public meetings to get input on our Fukushima work and share progress. We're also closely coordinating with other U.S. federal and state agencies regarding information about current concentrations of radioactive contamination in the Pacific Ocean. Based on the best scientific information available, no agency in the United States or abroad has identified any evidence of concerns for U.S. food and water supply or public health. To, and to say, oh, look, it's all coming from the other side of the Pacific Ocean. But of course, I, I think most people who are listening to this conversation around the world probably aren't interested in all of this um, as it affects Japan generally. They're probably interested in how this affects them and the, uh, the idea that there is this radioactive death cloud shrouding the planet that is going to fry us and incinerate us all in the next few years, um, which, again, is an idea that has taken on a lot of prominence in the alternative media in recent years. On your left is China exports pollution to U.S. and on your right is a different study of another models that are showing latitudes and how uh, you have trace which is just from burning fuels, biomass, fires and everything else like the incinerator fires and how that pollution makes it across the Pacific Ocean and how it lingers over America for extended periods and adds to the contributing amount of pollution in their environment. And everything in this scenario becomes further proof of the preordained conclusion that this radioactive death cloud is killing everything. And well, prior uh, to Fukushima, it was all harp. <laughs> that was exactly answer. right, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. There are these things that have these explanatory powers for people that, that simply by their very nature cannot be disproved because they explain everything. I mean, this is all well documented. This one, it was six new episodes of Trans-Pacific 
transport of the air pollution across the Pacific. You have to pay a lot of money to read it. And so we do have the abstract that it was measured between 1993 and 2001. And it's just normal pollution will make it across the Pacific Ocean is all we're trying to show you here, that you don't need some cataclysmic event to make a trans-Pacific um, voyage. And so for you to come out and demonize everybody saying that the pollution makes it from Fukushima over to here, don't forget there's a jet stream up there. Um, and there doesn't have to be any, any exact... Uh, I, it, it's interesting because the more that there is information to to debunk these these claims. So this was a Springer Journal published peer review. It showed evidence for Trans-Pacific air pollution comes from the three main sources: long-range transport of acidic and non-acidic contaminants into and across the Pacific Ocean from sources originating in the Pacific Rim countries and beyond Trans-Pacific air pollution. You can buy this model from Science Direct for $35. The impact of trans-Pacific transport of mineral dust in the United States atmospheric environment. A global transport model was used to estimate the impact of trans-Pacific transport of mineral dust or aerosol concentrations in North America during 2001. But what it does is shows you all, you know, what I'm showing you is all these studies of how pollution has been found crossing the Pacific Ocean and how it lingers over the United States. And that's all uh, E&E &E News is really doing. It's just showing you all you know, the studies that are out there and the models, and you can go look at these yourself and pay $35 and use it to bludgeon people like Ryan and James. Or just to, you know, have a model that you know is accurate, that this stuff doesn't need nuclear detonations, doesn't need the hurricanes to bring it over here. It just comes over normally. And, but we know that it came over here repeatedly, and so why is James and Ryan denying that it can come over here and denying that the jet streams exist when everybody knows the jet streams are real, whether Ryan Dawson or James Colbert wants to believe it or not, they actually truly are real, folks. Uh, for example, pointing out that the starfish wasting disease was, was first noted in 2008. Yeah, the San Francisco Chronicle said Fukushima radiation possible culprit, not just any random person. And the radioactive fallout, what do you think it does? It rains out and then it washes down to the coastline. I was a commercial diver for 14 years. But, I mean, they've been dumping depleted uranium into the ocean for a long time. I mean, yes, there could be other causes for that die-out. But because of all the radioactive fallout, this is the U.S. Model 137 cesium dispersal in 40 days. It's okay to assume that that washed back into the ocean. And sea stars use salt water like you use blood. And so they would have been affected very quickly. You know... If you ignore all the evidence, then when it happens, it's too late to do anything about it, right? If you, if, if you look at the symptoms and treat it, or do you wait till you're dying of cancer before you even bother going to the hospital? Um, the more that type of evidence comes out, the stronger people seem to get in their conviction that any of that evidence is being presented by, obviously, government-paid shills or, or what have you. It, it seems to entrench people even further in their their kind of um, uh, their main mentality that you know, on the onset of this disaster it was the 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 fallout that was happening um, directly into the atmosphere um, that was being belched out into the atmosphere and then rained down um, a lot of it happening in in that s section of uh, Japan and around there including over Tokyo where um, there was the something in in Japan called the speedy system s p e d i which is an acronym that I can't rem ever remember what it stands for but basically a system that's designed specifically to to forecast fallout um, for nuclear emergencies and the media was denied access to the speedy data uh, during the, the the first few weeks of this crisis um, and it was later um, uh, pointed out, uh, they, they eventually got this data months later, and it was pointed out that basically it showed that the, the forecast showed 
there would be radiation fallout over Tokyo, which um, presumably is exactly why the, the the media was denied it, even though it is a publicly funded and supposedly publicly available scientific resource um, that was specifically designed specifically for these types of emergencies. So, uh, so ag again, cover-ups have been ongoing, um, and and even some of the latest cover-ups that now affect the. Uh, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Council in the United States, NBC News, has just gotten hold of uh, uh, FOIA documents that prove that the NRC was deliberately misleading uh, the public about what it knew about the Fukushima disaster. Um, for example, a PR manager was writing in an email to his colleagues, "We, while we know more than, than these say, we're sticking to this story for now, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we know there have been ongoing cover-ups, and we know that this has been going on since the, the very... So it that's, that's the kind of cover-up we're dealing with, and it is very serious. And it is an ongoing concern that is continuing to leak radioactive materials into the ocean, and uh, and this is a uh, this is a concern. But again, as you say, there is the other side of this coin, which is the the alarmism that I think really does dilute some of the very real information about what's coming out from Fukushima and and how it really affects people around the globe. And just a specific example, I really did want to mention because I think it's a good example of this was that recent vi viral video um, that uh, that took place on a beach in I believe San Francisco where someone was walking around the beach with their their uh, their uh, Geiger counter and basically getting a high CPM indicating, oh, well, there's a radioactive source around here. And of course, by the logic of the internet, well, this could only be possibly, this could only possibly be from Fukushima. That was quickly debunked by people who actually knew how to use these uh, these radiation uh, instruments to read what kind of radiation it was. And it was not the type of radiation that had this the, the signature of the, the radioactive materials that were coming from Fukushima. However, that does raise the question of where these high readings of radioactivity on the beach were coming from, because they were there, but it was not coming from the other side of the world where th this Fukushima event was taking place. Don't forget there's a jet stream up there. Uh, partly it was because of the sand uh, on the beach itself. A new computer simulation shows how radioactivity is spread around the world from the disabled Fukushima Daiichi plant. The simulation was created by a group of researchers of, at the University of Tokyo and Kyushu University and released on Wednesday. The simulation is based on the scenario in which contaminated air was vented from the disabled number two reactor building on March 14th, three days after the massive earthquake and tsunami. Computer images show the radioactive material was lifted 5,000 meters into the air. It was then carried by westerly winds and spread over the Pacific Ocean. The images indicate that on the fourth day after the being, being vented, the substances reached the west coast of the United States, and on the, on the seventh day, they approached Iceland after crossing the Atlantic. The simulation is based on the scenario in which contaminated air was vented from the disabled number two reactor building on March 14th, three days after the massive earthquake and tsunami. But it was not coming from the other side of the world where th this Fukushima event was taking place. Uh, partly it was because of the sand uh, on the beach itself, but I think it also goes to show that there are all sorts of uh, radiation uh, sources that are local, for example, to the United States that make certain areas of the United States much more radioactive than certain parts of Japan, oh, yeah, which is set off plenty of test bombs in their own deserts. This is exactly part of the point. Um, certainly there was the, the decades of open air uh, nuclear testing, which has left a, an identifiable trace of, uh, for example, cesium in, in the radioactive season, cesium in the ocean, um, which is still... They nuclear waste into Indian reservations. And, uh, I, James, haven't you seen the meme on Facebook with the yellow scribbles all over the ocean? <laughs> um, that proves it. Yeah. Well, if you're referring to the uh, the the chart that gets thrown around, that's the NOAA chart of the um the, the yeah the wave heights from the tsunami itself, which was thrown around and uh, and used as an example of uh, presumably, I guess the idea was that this was supposed to show the spread of the radiation from the disaster. Um, which looked very menacing indeed if people f took it that way. But of course, that's not what it was about. It was about wave heights. So um, uh, uh, yes, I mean, that's just one symptom of a kind of a greater disease that I think has uh, swept around the globe, which is hysteria and um, and hype surrounding the, 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 the radioactive release, which is not something that I think is not a concern of any sort. But I think that the uh, what this has shown is that the public's understanding 
of radiation, how it works, what the dangers are, what kinds of elements are dangerous and in what way they are dangerous, how they're likely to enter any given ecosystem, um, how we can test for them, et cetera, et cetera. It has really shown the uh, the public's massive ignorance on these issues. And uh, it's been really an eye opener for me because- uh, Beyond I, I, ignorance, false confidence, because they don't know that they yes. don't know. They think they do know when they don't know. And the other dangerous part is the more the alarmists go around saying these things and they get dismissed and debunked, you have this uh, possibility of sort of the baby out with the bathwater. So people hear that enough times and dismiss it, but then when there is an actual problem, they just group that in and go, oh, that's nothing they always like, and, and they shouldn't be doing that. Well, that that's exactly right because there are, again there are real risks to this. But I, I think you're right when we when there is that boy that cried wolf scenario where where for example I'm sure you saw that um, story that creeped up in December where there was um, some footage. The uh, TEPCO has um, uh, live feeds of what's happening at the plant, and uh, there was some footage of some wafts of steam that came from Reactor Three. We've that, that all year. Exactly. This was this was the uh, the part of the story that didn't get picked up on. It had been doing that. Uh, I, I believe the first one was picked up in June or something like uh, like that. So this was nothing new, but it was new, I guess, to whoever decided to report on this. Which uh, the main outlet that I saw as the originator of this story about the radioactive steam that was going to engulf the United States um, was actually an outfit that I won't name by name to avoid giving them any undue attention. And again, we can actually measure the uh, the radioactive uh, plume in the ocean. It can be measured. Now, here's another interesting point. It is not being uh, measured. There is not a single federal agency in the United States that is measuring the, the waters off the Pacific coast. Um, and, and that is a cause for concern. So, of course, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, which I believe is based in Maine, has taken upon itself the idea of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding the effort to uh, to actually test some of this water. And they've they've started doing so and uh, and have released some of their preliminary results. But they are they're actually going through this. I think it's called our radioactive ocean dot org. I'm going to say that's uh, yes, our radioactive ocean dot org is the website that people can go to and they can help crowdfund that effort if they are actually interested in the real ra radiation readings that can be done. Um, the the early readings have shown that uh, that, that there is in fact uh, at this point not. The, the, the main part of the radioactive plume certainly has not reached the west coast of the United States yet. It is due to really start arriving this year, which again means uh, how could this, this viral video that was taking place in, in San Francisco months ago, how could this have been an example of a, a radioactive plume that has not reached the shores of North America yet? Unless, of course, it was that radioactive fallout in the atmosphere that stopped um, almost two and a half years ago now. So... So again, um, uh, it just goes to expose all sorts of weak points in, in people's understanding. But I think the interesting part of this is, again, the more um, people have basically bought onto the narrative that this is the extinction level event, we are all going to die, the more they hear uh, evidence to the contrary, the further entrenched in their position they become and uh, the less they want to hear it. So that any any good news, any news that any sane person would say, well, that's a good thing. Oh, you mean the radioactive plume hasn't even arrived really at the North America yet? Well, that, that's a good thing. Most people would, would actually be uh, relieved to hear something like that. But there are a lot of people out there that get angry because clearly this is part of the cover-up. So, uh, so it just creates this feedback loop where the only news sources people will listen to are the ones that say the most – the most outrageous things, really, and the ones that will will confirm their bias that uh, that basically the end is nigh and we're all going to die. Fear sells. How many times have you gotten an email, a personal email, saying "Get out of there, save yourself"? On pretty much a weekly basis at this point. Yeah, yeah, and it's the same old, same old. But um, talking about the water, where you're saying it's leaking, or they're actually purposely putting some of the radioactive water into the ocean. Um, is that going to affect the fish? People, I'm playing devil's advocate. Um, isn't that going to poison the ocean if they're doing that on purpose? I mean, it's radioactive, or how diluted is it per day? Well, actually, it, it does have a, uh, a noticeable and a detectable impact on the fish, for example, in the Fukushima Bay region. And this is something that is obviously being monitored here in Japan, and there have been 
um, through throughout this disaster, there have been times at which they have the the Japanese government has declared it perfectly safe. Oh, all the seafood's okay. Fukushima fish went back into the Tokyo markets, etc. And then they found, um, uh, I believe it was in August or September of last year, they found another fish with with record levels of radiation. That uh, that again shows that their their monitoring is haphazard at best. And that's, in fact, exactly why um, myself and, and uh, my, my family here are being extremely selective about seafood that we eat. Basically, unless we know where it's coming from, um, we're not going to eat it. And that's just one of the, the precautions that we take here. And I think that's that's sensible because the real um, danger, I think, at this point... Well, with- it is a lot easier to buy local in Japan. <laughs> It is, and I, I do appreciate that there is a lot of um, detailed labeling here about specifically what prefectures, produce, etc. are coming from. The question being whether how, how much you want to trust that and uh, how much you can trust some of the labeling that goes on here given some of the, the food scandals we've seen in, in recent years in this well, country. I'm a nard. I get it right off the farm. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and there is a, lo- a very good um, kind of local farming infrastructure here. Um, most families here in Japan have their own farm and will actually pick fresh produce on a regular basis. So it is it is a good culture in that sense, and I do really appreciate that. We also use something here called Green Co-op, which is basically just a cooperative that, uh, that sources uh, organic, in fact, non-GMO and uh, ingredients for all of their products. And in fact, they, they do radiation testing and they, and they post the, ra- the results of that. So that's another way that that we uh, are, are are keeping track of what we're ingesting because this is really a, a one of the the main concerns I think for for people in Japan is the actual ingestion of this. This is the way it's getting into the into the ecosystem and into the food chain is through the uh, the radiation that's leaking out into the ocean. And of course, in the in the early stages of this disaster, when the fallout was still uh, fresh, obviously uh, in the spring and summer of uh, 2011. Um, it was the leafy vegetables that you had to be concerned about, and then uh, the root vegetables after that that were sucking up the the radioactive fallout. Obviously, um, again, my wife and I were avoiding anything that came from that part of Japan um, as just our precaution against that. And and this is still an ongoing concern because, of course, in, with Chernobyl, um, that was the the key uh, intake of of the iodine one three one that that was part of the the radioactive fallout from the Chernobyl disaster. It was getting into the the, the milk supply. Um, which then got into uh, children, and there was a lot of cases of thyroid cancer as a result of that. Um, and depending which statistics you'll read and who you'll listen to, it, it was either um, as few as nine people and as many as one million people that died as a result of of that uh, fallout in Chernobyl. So there's considerable debate, um, although, yeah, there that's a, maybe a whole other thing to think about. So if they're going to put out... 40 odd minute videos and they're not going to bring in the other stuff for context they're just going to use the stuff that we've been beat up with over and over and over for three years then what's going on here well we're forced to come out and call them out publicly we just can't sit back and let them get away with it anymore nothing will change nothing will ever change the situation may be worse than thought. Uh, Studies from last year indicate that radioactive water will contaminate the entire Pacific Ocean in just six years. Kim Minji reports. This graphic shows the gradual contamination of the Pacific Ocean due to leaks of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. The simulation, which was run by a German marine research institute, shows the entire Pacific waters being polluted by radioactive water in just six years. 